I think it says we're live. Yes, it says we're live. Okay. So last week, uh, the last topic we talked about was did God create evil? And remember that when we translate words into English, sometimes there's more than one word that we translate the same way. So there are two, at least two different words that are translated evil. One of them means moral evil. And the other one means disaster or calamity. So did God create moral evil? No. But did he create disaster or calamity? Absolutely. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all of these things. Well, when it said evil, it means calamity. Yes, God does allow calamity to come. And if you look at the book of Genesis, Noah's flood, biggest calamity of all times. God definitely created that one. Oh, and I also wanted to mention this is probably our second to last class. Okay. Oh, oh, how sad. Okay, so the next question, I'm looking all the time for things that people will say this is a contradiction or an error in the Bible. And so a lot of these things I'm covering, you probably never heard of, but Every time I find one, I add it to this. Well, this is a pretty obvious thing. People say, well, it's an error in the Bible to say that humans came from, uh, from an act of creation rather than evolution. So do fossils show that humans came from apes? If you talk to a typical college professor or high school student even because they've been so brainwashed, they'll say, well, yeah, of course. So we belong to a group, could somebody get me some water, please, a cup of water, thank you. We belong to a group of creatures called primates. Primates includes humans, apes, monkeys, and uh, what's called the, the prosimians, which is lemurs, lorises, and tarsiers. So somewhere along the way, things would have had to evolve from some lower life form into the first primaries, primates. And after the primates, they would have had to split into the prosimians. Did anybody see the movie Madagascar? It was so cute. Well, um, you'll see lemurs and lorises at the upper left there. If you saw the movie, you'll know what I'm referring to. I always ask my students, what are lemurs like? They like to move it, move it. They like to move it, move it. Thank you. Because that's from the movie. And they had a cute little tarsier or eye eye in the movie. All right, separate from that is the anthropoids, which is the monkeys and the apes and the humans. So there's two major groups of monkeys. You have the New World monkeys, which are called platyrines, and it depends on which direction the nostrils point. And also the tails are prehensile in the New World monkeys. They're not in the Old World monkeys. And then the catarines are the Old World monkeys, like the baboons and the mandrills and the macaques and all of that. Every time I knew that we were going to have a fire drill at school, I always had a bunch of different ties, right? So I have a tie that had a picture of a drill on it, a drill baboon. And I would wear that tie. And when the fire alarm would go off, I'd say, hey, everybody, this is a drill. Oh. Uh, poor students, they were stuck with me. And then you also have groups of apes and humans. The apes in the world today, you have the Asian apes and the African apes. The Asian apes are uh, orangutans and gibbons, and the African apes are chimpanzees and gorillas. And in the fossil record, you have very similar things. So does anybody know what's the obvious difference between an ape and a uh, monkey? People, Size. huh? Size. Nope. People keep talking about we didn't come from monkeys. Well, that's true. But... Well, look at the picture up there. Look at the apes, look at the monkeys. What do the apes not have? Tails. Tails, exactly, yeah. What's that? One of the, one of the monkeys has a... Well, they have a, a kind of a short tail, very short tail. But people say, you know, humans must have come from apes because we have a rudimentary tail. Actually, the things that are considered to be our closest relatives don't have tails, so why would we? I keep wanting to click the wrong button. You know, some people claim that we have a little bit of a tail. Right. Yeah, there's a there's a bone at the base of the spine called the coccyx, and it's called the tailbone, but it's not a tail. It is never a tail. It's the anchoring point for the pelvic muscles. 
Anyway, that's not the point of this class. I just wanted to deal with the question, do fossils show that apes came, that humans came from apes? This is the kind of thing that you would have to fill in. If you're digging in the fossil record, there are probably in excess of a trillion fossils known. There's one fo fossil formation in South Africa that just this one is estimated to have hundreds of billions. So how many fossils would it take for you to be able to draw reasonable conclusions? A hundred? Nah. Thousand? Nah. Ten thousand? Eh. Yeah. Hundred thousand? Maybe. A million? Yeah. How about ten million? Yeah. Hundred million? Yeah. Uh, a billion? Yeah, we've got well in excess of a billion fossils. And what we find is that the fossil record shows us a record of clearly defined forms with nothing connecting them. They've been grouped into about 250,000 fossil species, and people will say, oh, well, here's the transition between this and that. Out of all of those 250,000 fossil species, maybe 12 have been proposed by anybody to be any kind of a transition. 12 out of 250,000, and even those are in dispute. So up there, even above the, the top where it says transition from some insectivore ancestor to primates, well, going back to the beginning, transition from non-life to life. We have no idea what that would have been, how it would have happened. Presumably, it was some sort of an invertebrate, a one-celled organism. Well, what's a transition from one cell to multi-celled organisms? There's nothing known. Okay, multi-celled organisms, invertebrates. What's a transition where the first one began to have something like a backbone? Uh, there's some spineless fish, but they do have um, a neural cord, a spinal cord along the back. But what's their ancestor? I don't know. The first one was exactly that way, and the last one was exactly that way. Some are, have persisted till the present. And then the transition where they first acquired bones. Nobody knows. Okay, so we got these bony things that are going to turn into fish, the fish turning into amphibians. I've just spent several weeks researching this, and I'm chomping at the bit for my chance to teach this maybe over in Africa, where people say that obviously the fish came out of water and turned into amphibians. That's one of the most ridiculous things you'll ever hear when you start studying the ins and outs of it. And then once they came out and turned into amphibians, how would they turn into reptiles? Well, one of the characteristics that's most obvious you can't really tell the difference between the skeleton of an adult reptile and an adult amphibian, but one of the obvious differences is the type of egg. Amphibians have a little gelatinous egg that divides into about six parts, and then they develop gills and tail and all of this stuff, you know, like the little frog tadpole, where reptiles have an egg that has about 14 divisions, and it has a hard leathery shell or a brittle shell like chickens do. But in order for this to happen, along the way, you're going to have to have a male and a female that are able to get together and reproduce. So one ancestral amphibian female somehow gets mutations that's going to make her move toward having a reptile egg. She needs them all at once. You can't just have one change and wait for another one because the eggs are not going to hatch. And so somehow this one female amphibian acquires all of these things all at the same time. So she's going to lay reptile eggs. Yeah, but we need a daddy. So somewhere along the way, at the same time and the same place, there's going to have to be a male amphibian that acquires the DNA where he's able to fertilize the eggs. And in addition to that, reptiles do internal fertilization. Amphibians do external, where the female lays the eggs and the, the male just, you know, swims by and squirts on them. Uh, so all of these things have to happen in one generation. I don't think that's plausible. I don't have that kind of faith. And then, somewhere along the way, the first reptile is going to have to turn into a mammal. And that's what I've been studying up on now. There's a big deal when you went to D.C., you didn't get to go to the museum. But there's a big deal where... A fossil called Morganucodon is supposed to be the transition between reptiles and mammals because reptiles have got one bone in the inner ear and then a bunch of bones on the bottom jaw. Mammals have one bone on the bottom jaw and three bones in the inner ear. 
So somehow or other, some way, the bones are supposed to have migrated from the lower jaw to the upper jaw, and two of them went across the eardrum. And meanwhile, the creature had to be able to hear and chew and all of this. Okay. Well, I've been studying up a lot on this, and it turns out that you all know what marsupials and monotremes are. Marsupials are pouched animals. Monotremes are like um, a platypus and an echidna, a spiny anteater. When they are first born, they're nowhere near mature, and it takes some of them up to about, I think, 140 days to mature. During that time, they gradually go through that kind of process where the bones move around. So all we have for this Morganucodon is not a single complete skeleton anywhere in the world. We have about three partial skulls that have been put together to say, here you go, this is the thing with the transitional bones. And we've got a bunch of teeth, but we don't have the important parts that would let us know. Um, but, you know, they show exactly the features that the embryonic marsupials and monotremes do. Now, the evolutionists are assuming that the fossil record is formed when all of the adult animals die. Well, you know, if the flood came along and it buried them at varying stages, some of them might have been fossilized then. So I'm, I'm still working on that, but the idea that a reptile would have evolved into a mammal, there's so many other features you have to have warm-bloodedness, has to evolve a diaphragm. Of course, that's a soft part, so you can't preserve that. Uh, and then finally, it turns into some sort of a mammal. There's got to be a transition from some insectivore ancestor into the first thing that we would call a primate. What is that? We don't know. Okay, there's got to be a transition where something splits and it gives rise to the little prosimians, the lemurs and the lorises, and then the monkeys. What's that? We have no idea. There's no proposed transition. Uh, you're going to have to have a common ancestor between the monkeys. There's the old world monkeys, the new world monkeys, the apes, the humans. We're going to have to have a common ancestor for that. What's that common ancestor? Nobody knows. And then, uh, and every one of these groups, the monkeys, the apes, the humans, they appear in the fossil record suddenly and fully formed with nothing leading up to them. Once they appear, they stay that type until they become extinct or until the present. And then somewhere along the way, some ancestral ape is supposed to have started evolving to where the chimpanzees go that way and the humans go that way. Well, our DNA determines um, stuff like the fact that we have two eyes, two ears, nose, mouth. You know, the reason you're human is you have human DNA, not broccoli DNA. I could just picture a bunch of big stalks of broccoli sitting here. Okay, so the um, the reason that you have all the features do is, that you do is because of your DNA. Now, human DNA, the chemistry behind it, is there's about three billion pairs of chemicals, and the order of the chemicals determines what you are. While chimpanzees, you keep hearing that they're 98% similar to us. It's probably more like about 85%. But let's go with 98% similar. Okay, if that's the case, 98% similar means 2% different. 2% of 3 billion is 60 million differences between us and chimpanzees. So how long ago are we supposed to have split off from the chimpanzees? I don't know, maybe 10 million years. And if typically, uh, well, you're going to have to average about 6 beneficial mutations of a copying mistake in DNA as a mutation. They're going to have to be good ones. Well, there's about three things that are claimed to be beneficial mutations in DNA. Most of them are harmful, but we're going to have to accumulate 60 million beneficial mutations in DNA in humans, or maybe 30 million in humans, 30 million in chimps. Okay. And this is going to have to happen over the space of 10 million years. Typically primates are going to start to breed sometime after 10 years old. So that means each one is going to have to have 30 beneficial mutations when they start breeding. And it can't be concentrated anywhere else in the body. It's got to be in the reproductive system. 30 beneficial mutations. And then they've also got to find a boyfriend or a girlfriend that has exactly the same mutations, but some corresponding mutations where the reproductive system can work together. Fine, we got it happening for one generation, but we need about a million generations. 
So, as I said, I don't have enough faith to believe in this. I don't have enough faith to believe that I've come from yeah. a monkey. And then, I uh, myself. okay, okay. And then we belong to the genus Homo, Homo sapiens. There's also Homo erectus, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo neanderthalensis, and so forth. But every single one of those have been determined to be humans. There's one group that's called Homo erectus. And if you look at an artist's reconstruction of it, it looks kind of ape-like. Well, I've gone around the world and I've seen Quechua Indians and Tamil people and a number of other ethnic groups, and that's what they look like. They don't look like a typical European, but the ones that write the textbooks are Europeans and Americans, and they say, this doesn't look like me, therefore it's subhuman. No, it's just a non-European looking person. So there's a bunch of fossil apes, and there's a bunch of fossil men, but there's no fossil ape men. Okay, so where did humans come from? In Genesis chapter uh, 2, I believe it says, God made a human body out of the dust of the earth. How in the world could that happen? Well, what are you made out of? Chemically, you're made out of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, phosphorus, and about eh, 30 other elements. Okay? Bunch of elements. You know where is a good place to find all of those elements? In the dirt. In the dirt. They're all down in there in the dirt. So uh, plants are at the bottom of the food chain. If you get hungry and you say, I really need some iron, it doesn't do you any good to go down to the hardware store and buy a box of bolts and swallow them. You're not going to take in the iron. They have to be in a form. Individual ions are colloidal where your body can take a hold of them and use them. Well, um, you can't do that. If you just eat dirt, you're not going to get what you need. However, plants have got a mechanism where this plant just it knows, I'm going to go out and grab some iron out of the soil. I'm going to get some calcium, some molybdenum, some manganese. And the plants pull them in. And look at that. Here's a ready supply of exactly what we need. Now, now, remember, we're supposed to have evolved from some single-celled ancestor going this way, and the plants are supposed to have evolved going that way. Really lucky for us that the plants evolved the drive to go get the minerals we need just as we evolved the need for those minerals. Coinkydent. That's right. And... You know, you have some of the, the feminists that they don't like the fact that God started with a male. God should have started with a female. Well, what chromosomes do males have? XY. What chromosomes do females have? XX. You could start with a male and perform a cloning operation and get females, but you could never start with a female and get males. So, looks like the Bible talk, knew what it was talking about. Do men have one less rib than, rib than women? There's some stuff that's been put out there to try to make us look stupid, like the flat earth idea. People say, oh, yeah, you know, the Bible says the earth is flat. No, it doesn't. But anyway, some people want to make creationists look stupid. And a lot of kids believe this, that men have one less rib than women. Okay, well, what happened to Adam? God performed an operation. He removed a rib, and he built up, he did a cloning operation. He built up the woman from the one rib. So let's suppose that you have an accident and you lose a finger, and you're a male. From then on, all of your male children will be missing a finger, right? No, nah, that's stupid. It doesn't have any effect on your DNA, which is what determines the feature of your kids. And uh, so why wouldn't it affect the females as well if that was going to happen? But, you know, it's interesting that God chose the rib because you know what's the only bone that will grow back in the human body? The rib. Oh, wow. Yeah. So by the end of his life, Adam probably had that rib back. Okay. So is it scientifically plausible for all humans to have come from one man? Uh, yeah. The Y chromosome is present in all males, so we can't tell anything only in males, so we can't tell anything about females, but at least all males, it's been analyzed, and it turns out, yeah, it's similar enough in every male that was ever tested. Yeah, obviously, we had one common ancestor way back when. There's also 
um, a part of your DNA called mitochondria. And a few years ago, this was put out there as being proof we all came from one woman. Well, it turns out the mitochondria can also partially come from the father. So, eh, don't use that one. But this guy is now called Y chromosome Adam. Ha ha. Okay. Does the Bible record miracles? Yes. Most definitely so. How could a snake talk? Yeah, well, it couldn't. Talk. Yeah, it couldn't unless there was a miracle. Yeah. Now, you know, the Bible tells us that Satan has the power to perform signs and lying wonders, lying miracles. So somehow or other, the Bible's just, it states very simply that Satan got inside the body of a serpent and began to talk. Well, later on, as Mercedes mentioned, God opened the mouth of a donkey and let it talk. And so under normal circumstances, it's physically impossible for a snake to talk, just as it's physically impossible for someone to rise from the dead. But this is not normal circumstances. Also, uh, demons got inside the body of pigs. You remember, and they rushed down the hill oh, into yeah. the water. So the demons like to get into the body of something or other. So somehow or other, Lucifer got inside the body of a snake, and he made it talk. Well, why wasn't Eve surprised to hear this? Who said she wasn't? She was living in a perfect new world, and there was all sorts of surprises. So imagine when this animal starts talking, she probably said, huh, that's odd. But she didn't know there was anything wrong because she couldn't have answered the question, what's wrong with this picture? She didn't understand the meaning of wrong. Where did Cain get his wife? Same place I did. From the pool of available women. Now there's about 4 billion women in it. Back then there were about, what's that? Back then there was about maybe 18 or 19 women. The Bible says that Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. The only ones it names are Cain, Abel, and Seth. But it said they had daughters. And Jewish tradition said they had about 39 kids. Poor, poor Eve. Imagine having 39 kids. Of course, she lived a long time. And when... Um, Cain went looking for a wife who was available, either a sister or a niece. The only time it became illegal to marry a close relative like that is at the time of the Law of Moses. We were talking about this on Monday where uh, people would marry their cousins back then. In fact, God never said you couldn't marry a cousin. He said you couldn't marry brother, sister, aunt, uncle, grandchild, grandparent, or anything like that. But at the very beginning, uh, the reason it's dangerous now is because we've got so many defects in the human gene pool. And if you have a child with a close relative, the chances are very good you're going to pass on a genetic defect. But how many genetic defects were there at the beginning? None. So it was safe back then. But even Abraham was married to his half-sister. Poor Mrs. Cain, though, huh? She didn't have much choice. In fact, back then, the women didn't have a choice. Somebody told them, this is who you're going to marry. True. In India, they still have arranged marriages. Okay, so this is one that I, I guess I disagree with a lot of people. Um, people say that, that why did God reject Cain's sacrifice of crops? Because he did allow sacrifices of crops later on. Well, you read what the Bible says, and in, are you all familiar with this? Cain's sacrifice was rejected. Abel's sacrifice was accepted. Cain got mad, killed his brother. So this is what the Bible says, King James Version. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but to Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. Well, there's a lot of commentators that say, nah, you had to sacrifice animals only. No, later on, it was part of the law of Moses. Yes, you could sacrifice crops. Nothing wrong with that. But um, there were regulations for offering crops, such as grain and so forth. They must have been acceptable. 
But notice that Cain brought his sacrifice, it says, in process of time. That means at the end of the harvest. Abel brought his first fruits. Cain waited until he was sure he had enough to spare, and then he brought it in, where Abel said, well, God, I'm just going to trust you to bring me more. Here you go. Here's my very first. So, you know, God wants the first fruits. He doesn't want the leftovers. The problem, it says, uh, he had respect unto Abel and his offering. Didn't have respect unto Cain and his offering. So it was the people that were the primary uh, beneficiary or the primary problem, not the sacrifice itself. So the problem was Cain's attitude, not his actions. God was perfectly happy with people bringing crop sacrifices later. But you just had to do it with the right attitude. And then, I love this. Before I ever took a biology class, I met a guy named Dick Lumsden. He was a PhD in cell microbiology, former dean of the graduate school at Tulane University. And he tutored me in biology before I became a teacher. And he answered this question one time. If animals were not meant to kill each other, you know, in Genesis 1, it says, no, animals are going to eat plants. Humans are going to eat plants. Well, if that's the case, then why did God give the snakes poison? What is snake poison and spider venom and so forth? They were beneficial. What did they use, like the medical Yeah, that's part of it. Um, these things are a mixture of a bunch of enzymes. An enzyme is a little molecular motor that goes like this. It either puts things together or takes things apart. Okay, digestive enzymes grab hold of things and break them apart into simpler components, and then your body can reuse that to make whatever you need. So people say, I don't want to eat eggs because, um, because of the cholesterol. Human cholesterol is not the same as egg cholesterol. Right. And people say, well, I want to get the active enzymes out of apples. You're not an apple. Your body is going to break apart what's in the apple and put it together into the form that you need. So the poison of snakes and many other creatures is actually a mixture of digestive enzymes. So when a snake injects it into something, the enzymes are going Right now, there are no known snakes that eat fruit. Um, killing is actually a side effect of the process. The snake is doing defense. It's defending itself, you know, by injecting stuff into you. But it's also beginning the process of digestion. We have no idea what plants were around before Noah's flood. We know that on the ark, the snakes weren't eating other animals. Everything ate plants. So there was some kind of plants they could have gotten by eating. Um, the estimate is commonly that over 90% of all of the types of plants that have ever existed are extinct now. So what were the nutritional characteristics of the pre-flood plants? We don't know. But there must have been some kind of plant where the snake injected the digestive enzymes into it, starts a process of digesting as a snake is in the process, process of swallowing it and getting it inside of his body. So after the flood, the animals, including snakes, didn't have their original di diet available, so they had to change to whatever was available, which now was mainly animals. And then also, why do animals have sharp teeth? A perfect example of this is pandas. Boy, pandas got these sharp little teeth, so obviously they must be predators, right? Nah. You know what pandas use their teeth to, to do? Yeah, Chew on bamboo. Yeah. So sharp teeth in itself, in themselves, don't mean anything to do with what the animal is going to be eating. In fact, can lions subsist on plant matter? Absolutely. In World War II, London, they didn't have meat for the lions in a zoo, so they fed them vegetation. And there have been several people that had pet lions. They raised them from cubs. And they fed them stuff like lasagna and so forth. You know, hey, you know how Garfield loves lasagna? Well, so did the lions. So they can subsist on vegetation if you give them the right kind of nutrients in it. What's that? We need to train them for that so they won't divorce so many yep. other animals. Okay. Speaking of, speaking of devouring... People that tell you the Earth is a result of a big bang and it's billions of years old and all of that and the dinosaurs, 
you ask most people how long ago did the dinosaurs live unless they're bible believing christians they're going to say millions of years ago so the question would be were animals such as dinosaurs eating each other for millions of years before humans came along this is what god said in the creation account genesis chapter one after he had gotten finished creating the humans and the birds and the animals and so forth and god said behold i've given you that is humans every herb bearing seed which is on the face of all of the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for meat that you know that's for food king james said meat and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creep, creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life i've given every green herb for meat and it was so so he said people y'all eat stuff that has seeds animals you eat anything just not each other at the beginning now later after adam sinned then through one man sin entered the world and with sin came death but the bible makes it plain that until adam sinned animals were not eating each other now there was no death but if you eat an apple you didn't kill the apple tree could there be any mention of dinosaurs or other reptiles in the bible well the book of job has always been understood to have been the first book written down and here's a description that you'll see in job chapter 40 behold now behemoth which i made with the uh, uh, job has been fussing at god saying come on come on talk to me god god said okay listen i'm going to talk to you buddy behold now behemoth which i made with you he eats grass like an ox lo now his strength is in his loins and his force is in the navel of his belly he moves his tail like a cedar well people will say i don't know maybe that was a hippopotamus or maybe it was an elephant have you ever seen the tail of a hippo or an elephant looks like a piece of rope this is an animal that had a tail like a cedar tree that's a huge animal and then also it says that um this animal is so big verse 21 he lies under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fens the shady trees cover him with their shadow the willows of the brook compass him round about behold he drinketh up a river and hasteth not he trusteth that he can draw up jordan into his mouth this is an enormous creature he's in the river he said i could drink this river i feel like it if he feels like it. okay does the bible mention unicorns the king james version is a majestic translation and it's been very influential in the english language but remember it was translated 400 years ago over 400 years ago so there are a number of translations in the king james that eh, probably aren't that up to date that's why i like the new king james it updates some of the language the king james old testament uses the word unicorn which is a hebrew ram nine times this is not what we picture <coughs> as a unicorn you know like my little pony or something like that all it means is a one-horned animal other translations put this as wild ox the Hebrew text was being translated into the Greek Septuagint several hundred years BC. So the translators there use the word monocera, which is one horned animal. It could have been a rhinoceros, uh, could have been any number of animals with one horn, or for instance, there's a monoclonius. That's got one horn. I think that there were probably still some dinosaurs around in the days of the Old Testament, especially. In the days of Job, so when God said, "Okay, look at this one-horned animal," well, it could have been a monoclonius, could have been any number of different things that had one horn. Flood, flood. What's the matter with you? How can you believe there was a flood? Everybody says there was no such thing as a flood. How can we believe in a worldwide flood when so many people deny it? Second Peter chapter three tells us this is what we've got to look out for in the last days. Knowing this first, now this is written by a fisherman, right? Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. That's a statement of a geological doctrine called uniformitarianism that says everything always happens at slow, steady, gradual rates, no drastic changes. And then just so you can understand for sure that he's talking about geology, the next verse continuing right there, no gaps in the middle, for this they, the scoffers, willfully forget 
that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. So Peter told us about 2,000 years ago, in the last days, scoffers are going to tell us three things. Number one, Jesus is not really coming back. Where's the promise of his coming? When I went to Israel, my tour group went up to the top of the Mount of Olives, and our guide is a Messianic Jew, and his group had been talking with the Catholic Church about leasing the Mount of Olives. They have a monastery up there. If you believe, the Bible says that the Mount of Olives is where Jesus' foot is going to touch down. If you really believe Jesus is going to come back to your backyard, would you agree to, go to negotiate with somebody to lease out your backyard? The very fact that they said, oh, yeah, let's talk about it, indicates they don't really believe it. Where's the promise of his coming? And then forever since the, uh, the fathers, fathers fell asleep, all things continue as it were from the beginning of creation. That's uniformitarianism. And then they willingly ignore the fact that there was a worldwide flood. No flood. This is the basis of all of the multi-million year ages that you hear in geology and in, all over the place, TV, movies, and so forth. There's never been a worldwide flood because if there was, you suddenly have cut about eh, three and a half billion years off the geologic time scale. The reason people use to deny the flood is an idea put out by a guy named Nicholas Steno in the 1600s. He called it the law of superposition. It said that the layers of rock are superposed one on top of the other. So the sediment is deposited, the oldest is at the bottom, and then the next oldest, and the next oldest, and the next oldest, and the next oldest. And I was teaching earth science one year, and I told my students, this is, you need to know this, but you don't have to believe it. Okay? And I asked them as a test question, what is the law of superposition? Okay, that, you know, the layers pile up like that. One of them said, well, some positions are so good, they're superpositions. Okay. So anyway, this so-called law, the law of superposition, has been falsified both in nature and in the lab. At Mount St. Helens back in 1980, there were tremendous streams of mud spewing out of the volcano up in the state of Washington. And the first layer would go, lay down a little skin, and another one on top, another one on top, another one on top, another one on top, another one on top. Another and about 100,000 layers were laid down one afternoon. One afternoon, what? So which ones were the oldest? Well, they're pretty much the same age. But if you use the love superposition, you'd say, well, obviously the one at the bottom was laid down, then the next year, then the next year, then the next year. The problem for the geologists is we saw it happen. And it absolutely falsified the law of superposition. And then there was a guy named Guy Berthold who did experiments at the Colorado School of Mines where he set up a repeatable experiment with a sluice and he dumped in sediment and he had water flowing and so forth and he saw how do the strata form. If there's no current, okay, Steno may be right. It just settles down. But if there's any current at all, no, it forms side to side instead of top to bottom. And the oldest sediment is what was closest to the source and the newest sediment is what's farthest from the source. So you can't tell how old something is just by looking at the sediment. But that's what the evolutionists are basing their entire ideas about the age of the Earth on. Why not just a local flood? You probably heard people say this. Well, I don't know. Maybe it was just a, a local flood combined to Mesopotamia or something like that. Well, I've been to South Africa. I've been to Asia. I've been to the western United States, New Mexico, and it all looks the same. So, in fact, if you go to South Africa and you go to New Mexico, you say, wait, where am I again? It just looks exactly the same. Uh, so it, it was obviously wide enough to cover multiple continents. Besides that, why build an ark? If you know this flood is coming, walk away. <laughs> God's pretty smart. He wouldn't make you build a big boat if you could just walk away. And then every continent around the world has thick layers of sedimentary rock. We don't know what happened to all of the sediment from before, to all of the, the land from before Noah's flood. 
it may have completely gotten pulverized. There may not be anything left except finely divided sediment from before Noah's flood. And people that have been up to the top of Mount Everest have said there's seashells up there. That's the highest mountain in the world. Now, it wasn't always as high as it is. So at some point, though, it was underwater and there were seashells there. And I was down in Peru one year and I was talking about this and a young lady raises her hand. Now, the Andes are the second highest mountain range in the world. She raises her hand and says, yes, I've been up to the top of the Andes and there are seashells up there also. So even the highest mountain ranges in the world were underwater at some time. We don't know how high they were at the time. And of course, all around the world, there are cultures that have legends of a great flood that covered the entire earth. We mentioned this uh, Monday afternoon in the Bible study. The Chinese language, ancient Chinese, has got some really interesting characters. The symbol for flood is a boat with eight faces in it. That's kind of cool. Yeah. What happens to that water? It's in the oceans. At the very beginning, there was water underneath the landmass, apparently, because the fountains of the great deep burst forth. So there must have been water, and it previously was trapped underneath. It came up, but then at the end of the flood, God juggled things around. He pushed the sea floors down and raised the land masses back up, and the water's still there. It's out in the oceans. If you would raise up the ocean bottoms and flatten down all of the, the land surfaces, there's enough water you'd have over two miles of water everywhere on the earth. There's a whole lot of water out there. So it's still there. Yes, ma'am? Having to put it in my head, when you mean two miles of water, uh, it means up from, from the surface up. Right. right. Yeah, there's that much water. Oh. But there are places in the ocean where it's five miles deep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, like the Marianas Trench, the Laurentian Abyssal, places like that. So if God created dinosaurs during the creation week, why didn't Noah take them on board the flood? Who said he didn't? Even the largest dinosaurs hatched from eggs, the largest known dinosaurs hatched from eggs that were about the size of a football. Reptiles grow as long as they live, uh, subject to their ability to be able to walk and eat. Many reptiles living in the world today have legs out to the side, and so their belly would drag on the ground, like if I was trying to crawl. Uh, but then the dinosaurs had legs directly underneath the body, so there was no limit to how big they could get. If you could keep them alive for a long time, they could get enormous. And we know that humans before the flood lived a very long time. A friend of mine had a little turtle when I was a kid, and his turtle was like 20 years old. It was one of these little things, but it was that big. They just keep on growing and growing and growing. And I think that all of us have a certain amount of intelligence, right? If you're going to build a big boat, would you put full-grown dinosaurs on board of it? No. no, we're smart enough to know. Nah, bring the young ones. So God is smarter than we are. He would have brought young ones that were at the beginning of their reproductive years. And the bone structure of dinosaurs shows us that there were reptiles. Since all known reptiles do better in warm climates than cold, there's one interesting exception that the Galapagos Islands, the marine iguana, they come out and they sun themselves and get nice and warm. And then they dive in the ocean and do this. And then they come back out and warm up again. But all of the other reptiles do better in warm climates. So we could conclude that after the flood, the uh, reptiles that were in cold climates probably would have died out. But the reptiles in warm climates would be one that would survive. And that's where you get the dinosaur legends from. Places that had a warmer climate. The country with the greatest number of dragon legends, which is China, is also the country that has the greatest number of dinosaur fossils. And as recently as just the last few years, I don't know, maybe not 10, maybe 15 years, there have been reports from Africa of very large dinosaur type creatures, Mokila and Bembe, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, right there at the equator where it's a hot climate. I have a friend that's been trying to get in there for years, and the problem is they've been having civil wars for about 50 years now. And you don't just go out in the jungle by yourself. You're going to be some the lunch for some kind of animal, or you're going to be killed by some of the soldiers. You need to get an escort, 
and the government's not going to spare soldiers for you with your silly little science expedition. They're trying to defend against all the people shooting. So why don't we fly over and spot them with satellites while they're under the tree covers? Why don't we use infrared satellites? They're reptiles. They match the temperature of their surroundings so they wouldn't show up. So people keep claiming, claiming they've seen Mokila and Bembe. I think it would be so cool if one day somebody would find them, but I don't know if we will or not. My faith doesn't depend on that anyway. But I think a few dinosaurs may have made it through the flood on board the ark. Nancy and I went to the ark encounter, what, two years ago? Has anybody else been there? You have, because your daughter has, has worked there. Anybody else? Go! This is breathtaking when you see this thing. This boat, it's an actual size replica. We don't know the exact shape. You know, the Bible doesn't give us the details. But the length of the cubit, taking it as about 18 inches, this thing is about 450 feet long. That's one and a half football fields, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. It had the bottom. It had three decks in there. And you go inside that thing, you say, man, it's so empty. You could put every kind of animal you could imagine in there, and you'd still say, man, it's so empty. You wouldn't bring the full-grown dinosaurs on it. And only land-dwelling anim land animals went on board. And since not many animals are large, the average size would probably be smaller than a sheep. The Ark was the largest boat that was ever built until the 1800s. Based on the biblical dimensions, it would have had a carrying capacity of about 522 railroad boxcars. Those are big things, railroad boxcars. Take 522 of them and put them together. It would take only about 10,000 pairs of sheep-sized animals to account for every single type of animal known on the whole earth that wouldn't even fill our th a third of the way up. We have no idea what else was on there. Of course, there was a lot of food, naturally. But they probably just recycled the water because there was rainwater coming down, which would be fresh water. They have displays of how that was done. Yeah, yeah. So it's not like Noah and his wife and family had to go every day to every place and shovel in the food. Well, you know, when you go on away on vacation, you put your dog's food in a container, and then the dog eats a little and it goes down. And, you know, every week or two, you go, oh, yeah, let me put some more food in. So they would have been busy, but they wouldn't have been swamped with stuff to do. Hope they wouldn't have been swamped. Okay, and then I'm I'm moving through the Old Testament from Genesis on up. Has, has anybody ever noticed where it says Lot's wife turned into salt? Well, first, if you look at the sense of the Hebrew, it wasn't that she was just standing there and she looked. No, she went into the little village with Lot and her daughters, and then she came back out to look back. So they were protected by the walls of the city. She was not. And it says she turned, uh, then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and the inhabitants of the cities, that which grew upon the ground. But his wife, Lot's wife, looked back from behind him, looked back, means she actually went back. And she became a pillar of salt. Well, this is not sodium chloride, not the stuff you sprinkle on your French fries. The Hebrew word is mela, which just means powder. So if you took a human body and instantly dried it out, what would be left would be a column of powder. That's what happened to this woman. She should not have done that. Okay, and then this is most definitely a mistake. Does the Bible contain mistakes? No. Yes, it does. It contains records of mistakes people made. Oh. God didn't make a mistake. Like, you remember when Paul was arrested, uh, there were these people, what, 30 or 40 guys, they said, we're not going to eat or drink until we kill Paul. Were they right? I think they finally ate. So it recorded a statement they made that was wrong. And like in the book of Job, there are some statements his friends made and the statements were wrong, but it, it's not incorrect in recording the statement. Okay, it records an action that Jacob did. Jacob had never studied biology. So God had already said, I'm going to bless this guy. He may be an idiot, but I'm going to bless him. Okay, Genesis chapter 30, verses 37 to 41. 
And Jacob took him rods of green poplar and of the hazel and chestnut tree and peeled white stripes in them. He cut it so you could see little white stripes and made the white appear which was in the rods. And he set the rods which he'd peeled before the flocks in the gutters and the watering troughs when the flocks came to drink, that they should conceive when they came to drink. And the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle ring straight, speckled and spotted. And it came to pass whenever the stronger cattle did conceive that Jacob laid the rods before the eyes of the cattle in the gutters that they might conceive among the, the rods. Okay. Jacob said, oh, that's some strong ones. I want their calves. And he put the rod out there so that they'd look at it while they're conceiving. Yeah, it has nothing to do with biology. He didn't know anything about biology. But God had already said, I'm going to bless this guy. He may be an idiot, but I'm going to bless him. So he did. The physical features of the animals are determined by DNA and not by what the parents see during mating. Jacob didn't know that, so he acted in ignorance. But God said, eh, I'm going to bless him anyway. In Genesis chapter 28, it's all about he was going to bless him. And so even though Jacob was wrong, God still blessed him. It wasn't because of his mistaken understanding of biology, but because God said, I'm going to bless him anyway. It was a miracle. Okay, when Israel went into Egypt, he had 10 sons. And you read that Benjamin had 10 children. How could Benjamin have 10 sons before he went to Egypt? Well, if you add up the ages, you find out Benjamin was about 30 when, when he went to Egypt. When they first went there, Joseph was 40. Joseph was his older brother. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, how old you old? Anyway, Joseph was... All right, if, if we go through the whole thing. Jacob had been with Laban for 20 years, and then Jacob was now, yeah, he was about 10 years older than Benjamin. Um, so Joseph, 10 years older than Benjamin, Joseph gets carried away as a slave into Egypt, and he's there for a long time, and meanwhile, Benjamin is growing up, and by the time Benjamin came in to Egypt with the family, Benjamin was 30 years old. It's not at all impossible for, for a guy to have had 10 kids, especially because they took multiple wives and concubines right. by them. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. That, so, that we must put the dogs right. Yeah. Okay, and then if you're really, 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 really picky like me, you look and you say, wait, there's two different lists of Benjamin's descendants. Genesis chapter 46 lists the 10 sons who entered Egypt, Bela Becher, Ashbel, Gera, Naaman, Ehi, Rosh, Mupim, Hukim, and Art. But then when you go to Numbers chapter 26, you find out that the only ones that are mentioned are Bela, Ashbel, Ahiram, Shufam, and Hufam, and the other ones are missing. Where did they go? Well, the first one is a list of the people that went in. The second one is a list of the people that came out. So they had been there several hundred years, and they were probably just absorbed by the rest of the tribe. So his older son had three sons, and he named them um, after his brothers. So it may be that the three sons that died out, okay, they're gone. They're not listed anymore. We've had this happen in my family, you know, where... Somebody died, and later they name another kid after the person that died. And uh, Becher and Rosh are not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. They may have just died without leaving male descendants. How many people went into Egypt with Jacob? Well, if you read Genesis 46, 26, it says, All the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins besides Jacob's son's wives, all the souls were threescore and six, that is 66. This doesn't include Jacob himself. Doesn't include Joseph, doesn't include Joseph's two sons. So that's 66 people. The next place, 4627, all the souls of the house of Jacob which came into Egypt were three score and ten. Well, yeah, Jacob and Joseph and Joseph's sons did come into Egypt. So we add four more and we got 70 people. And then you look in the book of Acts, then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred. Three score and 15 souls, that's 75 people. Yeah, there was also five daughters-in-law that came with him. So there's no contradiction between any of these things. They all fit together. And what time is it?
Time flies when I'm having fun. Ugh. Yeah, it's probably, I should probably stop before this because this is a complicated thing. And I'm not going to say that I'm the first one to ever figure this out, but I struggled with this for a long time. And there's a 400 year period mentioned to Abraham. And there's two 430 year periods mentioned in the Exodus. And people say, that's all the same. No, it's three separate periods that overlapped. And when you take into account the overlapping, then, yeah, it all works out. I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll go into this a little bit. Uh, in Genesis chapter 15, God said to Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not there, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. Well, this is the punctuation in the King James Version, which, you know, the translators did a marvelous job. But you might not necessarily put the semicolon there, God was actually saying that Abram's descendants would be strangers in a foreign land for 400 years. It would include affliction and servitude, but it wouldn't necessarily be the whole time. Because when they went into Egypt, Joseph had been there for a couple of decades, and they weren't slaves. In fact, it wasn't until after Joseph's whole generation, his, his last remaining brother, when he died, that's when they became slaves. And then they quit becoming, they quit being slaves 40 years before they got back into the land of Canaan when Moses let them out. So actually the whole time of slavery was probably more like about 230 years. And God had said to Abram, in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. Hither is Beersheba in the land of Canaan. They're going to come right back here, Abram. And they did 400 years from the time the first one, Joseph, went into slavery then they all came back 400 years later. And uh, so the 400 years in that prophecy, in that statement by God, ended when his descendants got back there to Beersheba, Hebron and Beersheba after Moses' death. But there were also some other, other, other things going on. God said they would return in the fourth generation. Well, you count up the generations of Levi's family and now. Yeah. Moses' generation, that's the right amount of time. So if you say, well, they must have uh, been in Egypt for much longer than that. No, the generations are listed. So the total amount of time that they were in Egypt was probably close to 320 years, but they weren't slaves for that whole time. About 90 years of the time, they weren't slaves, so the slavery was probably about 230 years. So it all works out mathematically. There'll be a test on this later. You'll have to calculate it. Okay, so uh, I may restart with this next time, but that's probably a good time for us to stop. Yeah, I got about yeah, 32 slides to go. That'll take the whole time next time. Okay, so those of you viewing online, bye-bye. I'm telling you, I am trying.